Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by Inside the Penguins, a proud affiliate of the Hockey News. I'm your host, Nick Berlansky, joined as always by host Nick Horwat and the Pittsburgh Penguins won back-to-back games over the weekend. We still have a little over 24 hours, a little over 30 hours until their next performance against the Detroit Red Wings on TNT on Wednesday evening. But a lot to discuss here as the opening week of the season comes to an end. Obviously, we have about 29 more weeks throughout the remainder of this season. So a long way to go for the Pittsburgh Penguins. It is a marathon and not a sprint and not a 6.6K, which congratulations to those who all competed and all ran or walked in the Mario Lemieux 6.6K. I got a notification that the last time I did it was six years ago. So uh, maybe I should get off my lazy butt and do it next year. I keep telling myself I'm going to, but uh, regardless, lots of action on and off the ice for the Pittsburgh Penguins of Genny Malkin leading the headlines for the Pittsburgh Penguins off to a hot start to this season. Six points in three games, two of those being goals, four assists, a four-point night against the Washington Capitals, and a nice feather in the cap being named the NHL's third star of the week. Horwat, did we underestimate Evgeny Malkin when we were making season predictions? Should we have been saying Evgeny Malkin 90-plus point player when we were talking about him in the preseason? So in terms of the preseason, I don't know if we underestimated him. I think notching him at about a point a game or uh, a touch under or just a touch over is about where he still is still going to land. This is just a great start. And honestly, uh, for what it's worth, probably just what we get for saying he had a very Malkin game in the opener. Yeah. All six of his points did come in the last two games. And that's, you know, there's nothing against that. It did still earn him um, third star of the week. It is still tied for, unless things have changed most points in the league right now, which I mean, okay. Yeah. Four, you know, teams are three, two, four games in, uh, six point and leading the league at this point doesn't mean that much, but it's a hell of a start for a player that, like you mentioned, we weren't, uh, you know, promoting that much. We weren't giving that much energy to, we weren't, you know, we were just going to give it the old, it's of Kenny Malkin going into his age 37 season. We can only get so much. We can only expect so much. He's exceeded expectations so far. It does help that, and it is kind of, not that it helps, but it's fun that one of the other guys that he's tied for the league lead points in is Jake Gensel. Um, we didn't expect him to be in the lineup yet, and here he is leading the league in points. So that's another big boost to the Penguins. But, hey, you know what, for Malkin specifically, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if – I think we're still spot on or at least good with our predictions of maybe about a point per game, maybe a little under, a little over. Mm-hmm. Um unless this is able to sustain somehow. I just don't see it sustaining at this level. Yeah. I do think he's going to have a good season, um, but I wouldn't be shocked to kind of see a couple of games off here and there in the near future. Yeah, at the end of the day, like I said at the outset of this, it is a marathon and not a sprint. And Evgeny mm-hmm. Malkin, although, as we'll talk about, not really sprinting on the ice, doesn't need to be sprinting on the ice. He's not doing it in his, his famed galloping Malkin version of himself. He's kind of just going out there And being a playmaker, you know, in the offensive zone, through the cycle, and even more so on the rush. A lot of great passing, a lot of smart passing by Evgeny Malkin early, and that's led to success for him. And this is his best start, tied for his best start, I should say, through three games. There were a couple of different seasons where he had four points through three. There were two seasons where he's had five points through three games, and this is the second season that he's had six points through three games. The last time he did that was in the 2018-19 season. He finished that year with 72 points in 68 games, otherwise known as an 87-point pace. So, yes, around a point per game, maybe a little bit higher than a point per game, is where we've seen him in the past when he starts this hot, probably where you're going to see him again this season. But again, The sky is the limit for this guy because he is ultra talented. I'm not going to sit here and say that he wouldn't be able to put over 90 plus points again in a season. He's hit 100 a couple times before in his career. Can he do that at age 37? It would be a phenomenal feat if he did that. But again, you're hoping to not have to rely on him to be able to do that. And the Penguins, although not, I would say, reliant on Evgeny Malkin on Saturday and Friday night, I do think that he obviously led the way for them, and I don't know if that's going to be the case throughout the season when you see all of the stars on this team that are going to be taking turns in the spotlight. Yeah, and it helps along the fact that we really didn't give Malkin his dues this offseason because we're looking at Sidney Crosby a lot this 
um, these past couple months in. Can he get another 100 point season? Can Sidney Crosby put up these numbers that you know have not historically been produced by you know older aged players in the league? We're looking at Crosby as the one to do that. No one looked at Malkin and went, "Hold on, he's a year older." And had you know point per game production last year. Does he have one? No one looked at Malkin and said, "Does he have one more, you know, hot season under his belt?" Mm-hmm. Um, he just might. You know, we we don't know. Maybe he's going to be the thirty seven year old that notches a hundred. Maybe he's going to be the thirty seven year old that notches ninety five. Who knows? Um, that's just something for Crosby to knock down next year. I'm sure that'll be the discussion again next year because it's always you know a lot of stuff. Let's just be honest. In Penguins land is surrendered centered around Sidney Crosby. Yeah. Right. So, but he's always had his wingman of getting Malkin with him. And this summer, maybe it's because there wasn't a contract negotiation. Um, the discussions of Evgeny Malkin was kind of pushed to the back burner. I mean, again, this summer, there was no contract for him, but it was just the summer of what can Crosby do? Uh, hey, look, Crosby's hanging out with Connor Bedard. That's really fun. Oh, look, the mm-hmm. got Eric Carlson. Let's talk about that forever and ever. Um, so it's understandable that we just kind of, didn't bring up with Kenny Malkin and how good he could be this year. And he's showing it to us, which is really good. It's not like this is a bad thing we're talking about here. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. I mean, you go into the off season after missing the postseason. Yeah. All the talk was, Hey, it wasn't the top three. So the trade yeah. Malkin skeptics were, were quiet on the back burner because he had over a point per game. You can't blame it on Evgeny Malkin for why they missed the postseason. And then Ron Hextall gets fired and that's news. And then Kyle Dubas is the hire, yeah. even that in its own, in its own right. It wasn't just, Hey, they brought in Eric Tolsky. Hey, Hey, they brought in this other guy. That's, you know, Matthew Darsh. They brought in this hockey perfect they brought in the top name at least the most polarizing name the most known name that was available on the market and kyle dubas this young hot shot hockey analytics guy that everybody started talking about and again malkin was not in a contract year like you mentioned he wasn't coming off of like a 500 point season like a like a like a guy like Connor mcdavid so you don't talk about that he's not on a team that made the playoffs so generally the conversation is a little bit lesser in the off season. And then you add the fact that Carlson came in and even Jake Gensel was getting a lot because of the injury and he's heading into a contract season. Tristan Jari was a major topic of conversation. And yet here we are one week into the season and who has been the player that has been the most electrifying, the best player for the Penguins, the most productive for the Penguins. It's Gino Machino. You know, he said after Saturday's game, yo, let's end the season tomorrow. I'll be in the heart conversation. And he's right because, yeah. I mean, after one week, you could you could play it as the three stars of the week or the three guys that after one week would be in the heart conversation. And I get it. It's, it's a ridiculous sentiment, but that's where he's put himself one week in. And it's a tremendous thing for the Penguins because Sidney Crosby's looked good. Jake Gensel, like you mentioned, has six points. Five of them are assists. He's a goal scorer. The goals are going to come, but his playmaking is already starting to show itself. Carlson is settling in, doesn't have a goal yet. Latang has looked really good, doesn't have a goal yet. So this is a team that still has players that haven't ramped up to the best of their abilities. And Evgeny Malkin is coming in and saying, hey, that's fine because I'm already at the top of my game. Mm -hmm. We're also forgetting that Malkin and Crosby spent all of last season healthy. Yeah, they came in. They they went into the 22-23 season fully healthy. They ended the season. Let's not say fully because everyone gets banged up during the season. But they ended yeah. the season playing all eighty-two, and now they had a whole off season to recover from all the minor things. There was no off season surgeries for either of them. Let's forget mm-hmm. about let's not forget about that. Malkin had one, I believe, heading into last season, or. At least uh, when he when he cleaned up his elbow and even Crosby wa- a couple had a wrist surgery. Yeah. I think that was heading into last season or something like that. Yeah, let's just remember that those two came into last season for the most part pretty healthy. Ended up playing all eighty two. They had a whole off season to remain healthy and are heading into this season fully healthy again. So we're just seeing an extension of at least if, and if Kenny Malkin say an extension of long term health, which is something we don't see from these guys very often. Um, and he's picking up right where he left off at last season, which was, I mean, yeah, not a ton of guys you know, produced at the end of last year. I thought at least Malkin was sticking around and really giving it his all. That Washington game comes to mind. Yeah. Um, that was late. I forget how many games came after it, but that, that sticks out as a 
Malkin was definitely still giving it everything he could to push this team into the postseason. Um, and now he's starting here from game one. Game two, like we said after game one, it was a very Malkin game. Here he is starting from game two, um, giving it his all and pushing this team into the postseason. And he's leading by example. I think uh, Mike Sullivan said that these guys are leading by example in terms of getting this team to wake up and um, push for everything that they want. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And speaking of leading by example, not just in the fact that he's going out there and performing, but he's building chemistry faster than any of you ex expected with Riley Smith, because you look at the top six, and as we'll talk about in the second segment, the top six is doing the heavy lifting, but that includes Riley Smith, who is the newcomer on this one, and, and the chemistry that has already been built, the magic that has already been made between Evgeny Malkin and Riley Smith is something that I expected to take a little bit longer, but I'm certainly happy to see that it didn't. I mean, the duo combined for three of the Penguins' six even-strength goals over the weekend, all on tremendous passing plays. And all, I, I think something that we talked about a little bit over the summer whenever Riley Smith was first acquired, all really on the rush. And that's what Riley Smith does bring. He is a rush attack specialist. Not that he and Jason Zucker aren't good in zone, because that's what Jason Zucker was really good at, was in zone, hounding on pucks, puck support, getting opportunities when you're cycling. Riley Smith really brings that danger off of the rush, that shot off the rush, and you saw it because his two goals, he absolutely picked a corner. And both of them were on beautiful feeds by Evgeny Malkin, and then just transversely on the Malkin goal on Saturday, Riley Smith driving the center of the ice in a nice, sweet, slick backhand pass right to Evgeny Malkin, right tape to tape, and he is just able to wire it past Jacob Markstrom. Just tremendous chemistry already from that duo, and I think something that's even more exciting is they're doing it off the rush, which the Pittsburgh Penguins haven't had in a few years, which is a genuine rush threat like they did back when Phil Kessel was with the Penguins and like they have now, it seems, with Riley Smith. Yeah, this is everything we talked about that could happen. We're just seeing it a lot faster than we expected. It is. Riley Smith is a, he's not younger, but he is a more consistent, probably healthier version of Jason Zucker, who, you know, did struggle for his start, the start of his tenure here, mm -hmm. uh, but really came alive in the la last season. So we're just getting an extension of Jason Zucker and Riley Smith, but it should be healthier. It should be a little more consistent. Um, and that consistency is showing pretty early, especially with this chemistry that they're building. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he's a pretty nondescript player otherwise, right? Like he's very much <laughs> does his job and remains in the lineup, does his solid work. He's going to contribute on both sides of the puck, which is something we'll get into, I'm sure, eventually when it comes to uh, the discussion of the bottom six, because this power play setup is extremely interesting now. Mm -hmm. um, but Riley Smith plays on both the power play and the penalty kill. So, yep. He's able to do all of the things and fly under the radar is probably a guy who's going to record a quiet, what's he average about, like 40, 50 points? Uh, I'm not yeah. sure what his points average is, but he's usually up around 20 to 25 goals and sometimes a little ahead of it. But no, Riley Smith, I mean, so far in the early going, he has been, I mean, he has two goals, but he's been all over the place. I mean, mm -hmm. you saw it even in the opener that he had multiple opportunities. He was robbed by Peter Morazic in the second game. He had multiple opportunities. He was robbed by Charlie Lindgren a couple times before finally breaking through. So it's not that he's just had these two opportunities and capitalized. He continues to get opportunities, and I think that is something that you have to give him credit for, and that's something you have to give Evgeny Malkin credit for because on a lot of those chances, it's Evgeny Malkin who's doing the setup. And that's, that's I think, the best part for the Pittsburgh Penguins fans is this isn't Evgeny Malkin taking over games like he usually takes over games when he takes over games it's give me the puck and get out of the way like we've mm -hmm. seen that so many times in his career that's not what it was on Friday that's not what it was on Saturday it's give me the puck and let's go as a team because he has a guy in Riley Smith who who seems to be you know you know his number two right now his right hand man despite playing on the left side and Ricard Raquel I mean he hasn't looked poor but you expect him to start to get up to speed with those guys. I, I think he's looked good and the chemistry's looked yeah. good. He just hasn't been the benefactor of that line performing the way it has so far in the season. And he'll get there. We've said this a thousand times before. Ricardo Kell can play well wherever he is in the lineup with whoever yeah. he's playing with. There's no worries there. Is it you know a bit of the Smith and Malkin show to start? Absolutely. But that's fine. That's kind of a good start for them to build their chemistry because we know Raquel's going to be perfectly fine just wherever he lands. First line, second line. If 
you need to drop him to the third, he can do that too. Raquel will produce wherever he is. And again, like last season, it'll just be a little quieter, a little more, a little more nondescript, but it'll be noticed in, at the right time in the right ways. And for the amount of you know under the radar scoring Riley Smith does, he does average about a little over fifty. He's capped out at sixty. So mm-hmm. there's a ceiling there, and it's not extremely high, but it is one of those players that those are the ones you need to push you over the edge especially in your middle six. Yeah, especially when you have a bottom six that isn't contributing the way the Penguins' bottom six hasn't contributed just yet this season. We'll talk about that and more about the Pittsburgh Penguins right after this break. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. I'm Nick Berlansky. That's Nick Horwat. as I put the display names up because I forgot to put them back up after doing the uh, Iceberg recap, which by the way, if you haven't tuned in after every game, we do have an Iceberg recap. Some of them come out the day after. Some of them, like this Wednesday, will be live on our YouTube channel directly following the game about five to ten minutes after the game depending on how long it takes me to get the graphics ready uh and we'll be live so come hang out with us talk a little bit about the game jump in the comment section get in on the action all that fun stuff but i'm nick berlansky that's nick horwat we talked of genny malkin riley smith little sprinkling of ricard raquel the second line has Mm -hmm. been good for the pittsburgh penguins jake gensel we talked about him a little bit six points in three games when we didn't expect him to play until the fifth game Sidney Crosby, three goals already on the season. Brian Rust, three goals already on the season. The top six is is cake. Mm -hmm. The top six is great. Bottom six hasn't really contributed as of yet. I mean, to some extent, it's what we all expected, especially when these signings were made. Everybody kept saying, okay, there's a theme here. There's a pattern here, Kyle. We understand Defense first in the bottom six. We understand you're trying to build this from the back end out and hoping that eventually they help in the offensive zone. But in three games, again, just three games, they've put up a goose egg in all three. Not just the bottom six, but the defense as well. And we all know that Todd Reardon likes his defensemen to get in on the action. And obviously, Chris Letang, Eric Carlson, you expect them eventually to get in on the action, but no goals up to this point. All 11 goals on the season scored by the top six, two on the power play, one empty netter, and eight at even strength. Obviously, not sustainable to do that throughout an entire season, but is this a product of just a small sample size three games in? That's really hard to say. The only point, like they haven't even picked up assists. The only point to be collected from that entire bottom six right now is an assist from Lars Eller. Um, Things will have to change pretty quickly on that in that bottom six i mean some of the bold predictions that have been out there is drew o'connor really waking up and you know at least preseason predictions drew o'connor waking up and finding a scoring touch uh lars eller leading the bottom six on scoring there's uh then what (laughs) a bunch of defense it's a bunch of we're keeping the puck out of our net now this is the growth of kyle dubas too i think it was elliot freeman said on the 32 thoughts podcast not too long ago that um Kyle Dubas is maturing a lot as a, almost a, as a general manager and as a president of hockey operations. Um, his main goal, his main focus used to be offense, offense, offense. We need scoring. We need scoring. We need to find a way, find ways to score more. I mean, he grew a little bit in Toronto, but we're really seeing the, really seeing it drive through in Pittsburgh here that um, he's looking for ways that. The puck just doesn't end up in your net. Just making sure bad things don't happen to you. Um, obviously, the Penguins have their top six is what is performing so far. Mm-hmm. Now it is Kyle Dubas has gone out and found the defense for this team. He has found the bottom six guys that can score. They can score every now and again. They can chip in. They just haven't done it yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, but their main focus is to keep the puck out of your own net. That mm-hmm. has been their goal. And... That's fine, and they and honestly, that's really solid considering they haven't been. I think only the third line has been scored against so far. Yeah, I mean, and that's once. And that's once. I mean, the fact that Jeff Carter's line has not been scored against yet, despite being hemmed in on multiple occasions, 
the bottom three is all at even. So I'm assuming they haven't. I haven't looked deep into um, what the exact numbers are. But I mean, the fact that Jeff Carter, Matt Nieto, and Nola Chari even hemmed in their lot, hemmed in their zone, like for extended time. I think the first one was like two minutes, um, and haven't been scored against. That's a really good start. It, it's not great that they're hemmed in, but it's good that they haven't allowed that goal, and they are uh, performing very well defensively. It's just a matter of finding that scoring touch to wake up. Mike Sullivan thinks it'll happen eventually. Um, and it just, it does need to pick up soon because the top six can't carry the load forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are correct. The five on five, the fourth line has not been scored upon. They have not scored a goal, but again, um, that's, that's, eh. that's not their job. Their job is to keep the puck out of their own net. Like you, you mentioned. So you're, you're hundred percent right on that. But I mean, to me, three games in is, is the reasoning. I believe that is exactly the reasoning that the bottom six hasn't scored. I mean, look, look at, look at what happened. Look at who's on that unit right now. The top six, with the exception of Riley Smith, who we just talked about, has had a miraculously short period of time to build chemistry with Evgeny Malkin. But the top six has all played with each other before. They're all holdovers. Five mm -hmm. guys out of six are returning, and they've all played together. And the sixth one is Riley Smith, and we, we've talked about that. Four of the Penguins' bottom six guys are all new to the team and are all new to each other. So yeah, there's going to be a period there where they're not going to be all on the same page. It's going to take a minute for them to build chemistry. And even if you don't like that excuse, how about the fact that it's not their job? Their job is not to score in every single game. You don't expect them to score in every single game. If they did, this team would be a perennial cup contender. If you had a bottom six that scores every single game and a top six that looks the way that the Penguins top six looks. So, you know, the defensive structure we mentioned all summer, and that's what they've shown so far. Yes, there have been a couple times where they get hemmed into their own zone. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It is going to happen. They might have built out a defensive core. They might have built out a defensive bottom six, but they're not going to go out there and be a bunch of, you know, selkie trophy guys, but they're going to go out there and they're going to keep the puck out of your own net. Like you mentioned, between the third and fourth line, only one goal scored against them so far this season. It's what you want. You'd like to get a little bit of scoring. That will come with time. Clearly, they're going to score eventually. You're hoping that it picks up in frequency as, as the season goes on. But as long as they're doing their job and not getting hemmed in every single time, which did happen late last season, it was almost every single time those two lines were on the ice, they were hemmed in. It's happened a couple mm -hmm. times this season, but also there have been a couple times this season, namely the second period, the start of the second period against the Washington Capitals, where the third and the fourth line were absolutely dogged in the offensive zone, cycling the puck, continuing to keep the momentum, and it led to the Pittsburgh Penguins scoring the first goal of the game. That is exactly what you want. They might not have scored, but they kept the momentum on. They absolutely drained the Washington Capitals by keeping them in their own zone. And then they basically put it on a tee for the top six to go out there and finish. It's all you're asking from them. And I, I understand that you want to see goals. And I understand that changes will be made if there aren't goals because they need goals. You can't have a repeat of last season where the, the leading scorer of the bottom six didn't even reach the 30 point mark. You, you yeah. need a little bit of a change in that. But at the same time, let's not act like it's not a massive improvement on what we saw at the end of last season. It's big. They're not getting scored against. And that's huge. Yeah. Um, I think people just want things to happen now. It was, yeah, and and that's what how and that's how it's going to be for the Penguins at least through the first month. They want things to happen right away. It does because we talked about it all after the opener. Well, it's the same nonsense from the season from from the previous season carrying over. Yeah, so fans immediately got a little impatient. Immediately, that's just the way <clears throat> it was meant. Or not that it was meant to happen, but that's just the way. It was going to be whenever you enter your season, immediately lose the same way you lost 12 games the previous. Um, and you came into the year saying, hey, here's how we were, or at least showing, here's how we've improved in all these areas. Scoring from the defense, got more of that. Much more defensive-minded bottom six. While they were defensive-minded in that game, clearly, mm -hmm. um, it just we want to see scoring from it now because it also didn't score last year. and. You know, there'd been at least a little bit of discussion of, hey, you know what? These guys can chip in. Well, we all want to see it right away now. That's kind of and it's, that's kind of one of the problems that comes with losing the first game the way you did. Mm -hmm. um, 
that all of a sudden everyone's going to become a little impatient. They're going to want to see rebounds and bounce backs from everyone right away. And we've gotten it from the top six. For what it's worth, most of the defense we've gotten it from. Goaltending, definitely got it from. Everyone is excited about both goalies right now, I would assume. Mm-hmm. And it just mattered the bottom six waking up and carrying their own load now. Um, and again, they're doing it, right? Like they are they are carrying their own load. They're doing exactly what they were brought here to do. <clears throat> and that is to keep the puck out of their own net. It is now just a matter of chipping in, doing part two of their uh, mm-hmm. two-part process. Getting there is just a matter. It's a matter of getting there. Okay, so who do you think chips in first? Which bottom six player? We'll, we'll we'll say bottom six because the I think the obvious answer is one of Chris Letang or Eric Carlson when you include the defense. We'll get to that in a minute. But which mm-hmm. bottom six player do you think breaks through first and gets a goal this season? I'm going to say and hope that it's Drew O'Connor. I think um, he's looked good. He's had a couple of decent chances. Uh, it's just a matter of breaking through. Uh, we're all speaking very highly of Drew O'Connor and all always have. Um, but heading into this year, we're really expecting something big from him. I think he'll break through first. I think he'll be the one that gets it going for the bottom six. Like we mentioned with – or like, like we mentioned we didn't talk about it, but like it was said on Twitter with Riley Smith, once he gets one, it's going to be an avalanche. Mm-hmm. He got his one. He got one immediately the next game. And we've had a couple of days off. It's been a long few days off. Yeah. But I think for Drew O'Connor – at least for him and maybe the entire bottom six. And this would go for anyone that scores in the bottom six. They're going to get that one and the avalanche should you think it might, might open up. It could kind of build that, add that juice, build that confidence of, all right, we can do it. Let's continue. Mm -hmm. Um, I just think uh, Drew O'Connor nails it first because that'd be huge for him. I like your O'Connor pick. That's one that immediately came to my mind as well, because I think that he's probably been the closest so far. I think he's performed the best so far. Yeah. Bottom six when it comes to just individual performance. But my prediction, uh, again, this is low stakes, but it feels like a gut feeling and my gut can be wrong. It feels like it's going to be big Jeff Carter. It feels like he's going to be the first to break through. I mean, he almost did on Saturday. He had that one opportunity on Saturday where he looked like he was shot, maybe not out of a cannon, maybe like an antique cannon that sends you at a little bit of a slower velocity, but it looked like he was shot out of a, of an antique cannon into the offensive zone. Unfortunately, he missed the net entirely, but you know, he still has that scoring touch to his game, right? Like there were some people that said, Hey, maybe in a lesser role, with lesser, you know, responsibility, he can just lean into what he does best, which is get in front of the net, be a, a big body, and then put away opportunities, finish chances, use his shot a little bit more than he did last season. So I, I think maybe that breaks through. I mean, look, you look at O'Connor, you look at Eller, you look at Jansen Harkins, who we'll talk about at the end of this show. These are guys that, you know, specifically Harkins and O'Connor, they're they're younger guys, unproven guys. They might try to do a little too much whenever the pressure starts coming on. Jeff Carter doesn't care, right? Mm-hmm. So he's going to play even keel from minute one to minute 60, and that's going to show. And maybe that is what puts it over the top. Maybe that's what helps him break through. So, you know, I, I, have, I feel, have a feeling that it's going to be Jeff Carter. Now, again, there's a chance that Jeff Carter scores five goals this season and I'm completely off base, but you know, he had, he has that pedigree of a goal scorer. And yeah. if he gets in the right areas, maybe that fourth line starts to click where Achari and Nieto continue to be a nuisance and it just pops right out to him and he lets the instincts take over and he scores a goal. So I'll say Jeff Carter for this one. And when you mentioned that last season, the bottom six was, you know, the bottom, the top bottom six goal uh, scorer only had 20 something points. It still was Jeff Carter. It was, yeah. Jeff it Carter still was. It still was Jeff Carter who notched those twenty nine points. Um, for as much flack as everyone gave him, uh, yeah, you're right. He doesn't care. <laughs> he <laughs> I, does not care. I asked him probably the first or second day of camp, like if he's setting any sort of like, you know, goals or mindset or what he's trying to accomplish coming into this upcoming season. He said he doesn't do those. He doesn't really go into a year looking to improve or be better or you know, just try and be a step up. So he says he's going to go out and play his game. Whatever happens, happens. I thought maybe he'd give me a little, (laughs) I'll try and be better. (laughs) Um, But no, uh, so 
we don't know exactly what we're going to get from him. We don't know what he's expecting of himself, really. Um, but heading into what could be the last year of his career, we yeah. can maybe presume that it is something that is a nice final bow on the career of Jeff Carter that has been successful. Two Stanley Cups, over a thousand games. The point number is escaping me, but he's had a successful career over quite a few years too. I mean, he's been around since he's a pre lockout uh, player, isn't he? Nope. For 05, 06 was also his rookie season. Um, 836 points beat you to it. Yeah. Uh, but 1200 games. Uh, he's, he's had a success, long successful career. And also you don't play that many games for, you know, when you're bad. So mm -hmm. there's maybe he expects more of himself. He's just not going to tell us. And that's perfectly fine. Yeah. He, he's at the point of his career. And like you mentioned, it could be the last year of his career. I'm assuming he would know that, you know, it's yeah. the last year of his contract, certainly a contract that he's not going to see again, right? He's not going to see those numbers again yeah. in a contract. It's going to be league men. If anything, he's probably just going out there and trying to play hockey and enjoy himself. I mean, if it's the last year of playing a professional sport, you're going to go out there and you're going to enjoy yourself. A guy that's won Stanley cups, a guy that's played in multiple big games, a guy that has had a successful career, just enjoy yourself. Why yeah. put any extra pressure on, especially after the season that he had last year? He's like, you know what? I just got to leave that behind and just go play hockey. I mean, it, that might be what's best for, for, for Jeff Carter. So we'll see what he's able to do moving forward. If he scores that first goal, I will certainly take a victory lap as I'm one to do. If he doesn't score the first goal, then, oh, well, I was wrong and you can call me out on it. I, I don't care. You know, similar mm -hmm. to Jeff Carter. I just don't care. But uh, before we head out of this into the break, uh, I do want to ask, Will Eric Carlson or Crystal Tang? We're going to ask this on Twitter. Actually, it's a good it's a good Twitter poll. Uh, will Eric Carlson or Crystal Tang light the lamp first or what? Uh, I'm going to go with Carlson. He's been firing the puck as much as he can. He looks to be finding those offensive opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, Letang has very has you know picked up his assists. I feel like he's definitely got his touches as well. Um, six shots, but there's something about Eric Carlson who find those shot numbers. Uh, he's had his open chances he's got eight i feel mm. like all eight of them have been oh there it is That's scoring chances like oh, ah, yeah. should have gone in or could have yeah. gone in yeah so i still think it'll just be carlson um and it'll be another avalanche situation he's gonna pot one and here comes the rest it should mm. be um pretty it should come pretty easy to him he's had plenty of opportunities you wonder who else is shooting the puck a lot more too though i know this has nothing to do with the conversation but eric uh marcus petterson he is. Notice him just kind of at least maybe not reaching the net or hitting a goalie, but he's at least firing a lot, at least a lot more than uh, I would have expected to start the season. Well, you know how when you watch a TV show, you start to kind of like think like the characters in the TV show. Like if you watch Peaky <laughs> Blinders, you start to think in a little bit of a, of a heavy British accent. Maybe playing with a guy like Eric Carlson has Marcus Petter thinking, Pedersen thinking, okay, shot first. Here's a shot opportunity that he didn't think about before when he was playing with a guy like Jeff Petrie. So, I mean, maybe it's like, you know, assimilating to the defensive partner that you have and you just kind of start to take on their traits and characteristics a little bit. Well, then who's he playing with that's making him fight tough guys? That's just been inherent <laughs> where he's just, you know, he likes to pick the biggest guy in the room and say, all right, let's go. I was so baffled by why and how that fight materialized. I mean, there's a reason. And again, there mm -hmm. was there was somebody and a couple people on Twitter that were like, Jeff Carter played more at five on five than the first line. Yeah, because the, the first line didn't play in the last six minutes of the game of a four nothing victory. When you have Tom Wilson going to go pull Tom Wilson crap yeah. like you knew that was going to happen. Mike Sullivan, also, is, it's, it's not his first rodeo. He knew he's like, all right, Tom Wilson is going to do something stupid here. I'm not putting Crosby, Gensel and Rust on, on the ice. Now, Malkin, big guy, he can do it. Malkin, not the Cros Crosby's won almost every fight that he's been in. He Crosby is the antithesis of Pedersen. He doesn't yeah. fight very often, and he knows when to pick his spots. Pedersen just says, "Yeah, you could probably pound my face in. Let's go." Pedersen's got a height advantage, but he certainly doesn't have a uh, weight and strength advantage. Not that he's not strong, but he's just kind of tall and lanky. Um, well. Yeah, and going up against Tom Wilson, you could see the second he clenched with Tom Wilson, he was like, oh, no, this was a bad idea. Like, I might break my jaw here. Sorry, Zach Aston Reese. It's our, oh, all right. Well, he didn't. And I'm 
for, uh, for what it's worth, I'm taking Carlson to score first. I'm just trying to get off the yeah. get off the topic. Yeah, uh, that's fair. <laughs> and I thought I had something else, but I forgot it. So continue. Go ahead. Okay. Well, mine, Carlson Latang. I think it's honestly close because I really feel like Chris Latang has performed very well. Uh, to start the season, particularly on the offensive side. I think he's making smarter decisions in the first couple of games. So you know what? I'm going to pull a Leroy Jethro Gibbs. I'm going to trust my gut for the second straight time, and I'm going to say Chris Letang does it. I mean, Letang, I mean, tomorrow night, he has seven career goals against the Detroit Red Wings in the regular season. That's the second most among a non-divisional opponent. He absolutely torches the Florida Panthers, by the way. 11 goals against the Florida Panthers in his career. <laughs> But second most on that list is the Detroit Red Wings. So you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna rock with uh, I'm gonna rock with Chris Letang and trust my gut once again. I like it. <clears throat> I mean, it's a 50 50 chance. So it, yeah. it really. I mean, it's red or black. You know, let it roll. But we're gonna take a quick break and we're gonna talk a little bit about somebody else in the bottom six and Jansen Harkins and how he's performed to this point in the season. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast. Final segment here of the show. Going to talk a little bit about Jansen Harkins. Surprised all of us whenever he was picked up on waivers the Monday of the final week of the preseason. Then he came out, had two stellar performances in preseason hockey, and earned himself a spot on the third line to start the season for the Pittsburgh Penguins. He's certainly come back down to earth since then. Uh, Three games played, no points. As we talked about the bottom six, not scoring very much. 37% of the shot attempts at five on five, 25% of the expected goals for that is easily the lowest on the team. He is outchanced 17 to seven when he's on the ice at five on five. He does play on the second penalty power play unit has not touched the ice on the penalty kill. Fun fact that Kenny Malkin is credited with one second of penalty kill ice time to this point in the season. But, uh, more than Jansen Harkins. Jansen Harkin has a sm- stellar 0.00 seconds on the penalty kill. How long do you see his leash being before somebody is called up to take his spot? Boy, I hope it's not that long. Not that I dislike Jansen Harkins. Not that I dislike him on this team either. I mean, he definitely earned his spot whenever it came to those preseason games. Um, there's just been something in the water for him that's just not the same anymore. It is now the big time it is now the real deal and it hasn't looked the same and just i'm shocked he's on the second power play to be totally honest with you and that might just be a but so is jeff carter and that might just be a uh side effect of having a slew of defensive forwards in the bottom six right you kind of run out of options through the top you know when through your top unit whenever you're throwing out all your heavy hitters you're kind of out of names once you get to the last uh, five guys. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe they should experiment with calling somebody else up and then throwing him into that second power play unit. And like I said, Riley Smith is playing both the penalty power play and the penalty kill. There's a lot of crossover when it comes mm-hmm. to playing both sides of the puck here. But uh, Jansen Harkins, I mean, <clears throat> I know they picked him up because he had good offensive numbers at the AHL level last season, 50 points. I mean, that's, you know, we, <laughs> Alex Nylander had 50 points in the AHL last season. We said, we need him in this NHL lineup now. Yeah. Uh, then we got him. He had a point in nine, but I think we still at least understood that he looked good. He was mm-hmm. passing the eye test if he wasn't scoring. Jansen Harkins here, 50 points in the AHL. I said it not that long ago. He's on the second power play unit. He has like 13 career goals. In the NHL with I forget how many games exactly uh, 157 hmm. oh I didn't realize it was that high okay um this is tough this is really tough I don't I don't want to say you should be out of this lineup because it's we're three games in immediately yeah. having this overreaction of these guys shouldn't be in lineups um is it is an overreaction but again when mm-hmm. you lose your first game Everyone gets impatient and they want to see things happen right away and they want to see things happen quickly. Also, all of last season is going to make this fan base impatient. We especially need to see with this, the bottom six, yeah. Especially with the bottom six, they need to see the success now. They need yeah. to see it working now. 
Mm-hmm. And I've been saying this all off season too, as much as the bottom six is improved, I personally would like to see a scoring touchdown there. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm waiting for the scoring to wake up from some of those guys, but no one strikes me as a threat. They need a threat down there. Um, could Alex Nylander fill into a spot like that? Sure. Uh, Kyle Dubas wants more from him. Maybe Vinny Hanestroza? Sure. Andreas Janssen is, I think that's a failed experiment. Uh, that, well, that was a brutal camp in preseason. Yeah, and then what he was a healthy scratch to start in Wilkes Bear. Yeah. That's that's not what that's not where you want to be. I mean, Thanks. that's not where you want to be in an organization that has plenty of options. But no, yeah. you're 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 right that clearly the leash is gonna be longer. If the leash wasn't gonna be long to begin with, then they wouldn't have started with 12 forwards, right? And, and even if they did, they would have adjusted immediately and brought that 13th forward up and, and put another defenseman on waivers but they haven't done that. They still only have 12 forwards on the roster. So I do think the leash is a little bit longer, certainly longer than three games. Um, I know that that's how long that Jonathan Gruden had last season, but um, that that's, that's not the measurement we should go, go off of for, for anybody that's actually a veteran. That's, that's the young guy measurement there. Uh, Did he get more or less than Jonathan Gruden? But when it comes to a guy like Jansen Harkins, I mean, I would imagine he gets at least another week or two to give an opportunity to show what he has for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And also because it's not just him that's not performing well in the bottom six, right? Especially offensively. It's not just him. It's the entirety of the bottom six. So you can't just, you know, get a scapegoat, even though, yeah, individually, I I think there have been some issues with Jadson Harkin's game. He looks a little overwhelmed at times. The puck bounces off his stick a little bit too often. And as Jesse Marshall said on on Twitter or or whatever you want to call it, he said, sometimes it just looks like he doesn't have the speed to play in the league. Not that he doesn't have speed, but it's just a, a different level when the game speed is so fast that it looks like he's not able to keep up at points. So again, it's early. He could turn it on in an instant. Uh, he had success against Detroit in the preseason. Maybe going back to Detroit and playing that same team is going to be able to ignite something for him tomorrow night. But, you know, somebody's going to have to go on waivers for him to be taken out. That's another reason why I think his leash is a little bit longer because – Kyle Dubas, while not afraid to use waivers, probably not going to pull the trigger on that three games into the season and potentially risk losing. You know, if it's not Harkins, if you want to say, hey, let's not send him all the way down to wilkes Bear, risk losing a guy like Ryan Shea, who the Penguins very much like having on their roster, or a guy like, why can't I think of his name right now? John. The John Ludwig, the other scratch. I wanted to say Victor Hovland for some reason. I do not know. But John Ludwig, who they literally just acquired via waiver claim a week ago. They don't want to risk sending him down or losing him to waivers because somebody else isn't performing. And that's, you know, that's, it's just not smart business. So the only other way that they would get him out of the lineup is to go 11 forward, seven defensemen. And again, I've, I've been pretty vocal about how I don't like that. Yeah. I've seen some uh, arguments for it that have been interesting, Um, but it's, it's a start. It's the start of a new season. We, those are arguments that you have mid season time, late season. And when you're really trying to make a push and giving certain guys more ice time, that's what it breaks down to. Uh, but it's not a thing you do early in the season. You have to see what you have with the players you've got. Mm-hmm. And we got Jansen Harkins and, you know, maybe something does wake up. It's just, he never struck me as someone who would actually make this lineup. Even this, the moment we uh, claimed him off of waivers, I think, I immediately assumed he was just going to continue his trip to the AHL, mm. but uh, he didn't. I don't know where things go from here. Uh, the leash is long enough that he should deserve um, a couple more chances, but uh, if things if he doesn't look phenomenal in the next couple of games, something's got to change because, again, that bottom six, it's, you're allowed to be impatient with it. Because yeah, you have options. That's the reason you signed so many guys. Yeah, you because you have so many options, you're allowed to be a little impatient with it. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't want to completely overhaul and be dramatic about things, mm-hmm. but you're allowed to have a little impatience. You're allowed to expect more and expect more right away. Yeah, it's a long season, but um, you want the guy, these guys, to click right away and mm-hmm. sustain success if they're able to. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. And before we go, I'm just curious as to your opinion here. It doesn't have to be a long answer, but who do you think gets that first call up? Because it's going to happen eventually, regardless. It will happen eventually, yeah. Uh, who do you think gets that first call up? Because I think the longer we go without it, 
the lesser and lesser preseason performance matters and the more it's about who's performing currently in Wilkes-Barre. We saw that last year with Jonathan Gruden, again, second mention on the podcast. And he had a goal in the opener, too. So, I mean, shout out, Jonathan Gruden. I that, that And that's honestly really tough. I know you want it to be a short answer, but it's honestly tough to kind of nail down one person because we have that gluttony of options. So yeah. Um. And especially when it comes to trying to nail down the right position. And, you know, if you're trying to keep it a right winger, um, that's also tough. But if I had to really throw a name out there, I think Vinny Henestrosa goes first um, just for the sake of he's able to play play both sides, which is something that Mike Sullivan loves. Um, and Mike Sullivan has that previous relationship, so there's something there. Because we're wait, – we're, I wouldn't say Sam Poulin yet because we want to, they want to no. see him really – gain those minutes in the AHL and gain that speed. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that was redeems a horn. I forgot about him. He's down there. Yeah. He could come up pretty easily, except he's not going to be that scoring threat that I think this bottom six still needs. Mm. And Alex Nylander, it, I, he's crossed my mind a couple of times when I'm trying to come up with a name here, but something about the way Kyle Dubas talked about him during that preseason presser of saying, he took steps back, you know, during the preseason and during camp makes me think he's further down in line than we really think. Yeah. Um, and that he won't be first. And they really want much like St. Paul. They want to see him gain that speed and really prove himself in the AHL before they can make him mm-hmm. uh, a full-time AHL again. He might be second or third. I mean, the way Dubas spoke of both pool and Nylander though, is he expects Nylander to be in the NHL by the end of the season. So eventually he'll get his call. Um, and Poulin, he wouldn't be shocked to see him up here long term either. So we'll see. I'd say first in line goes Vinny Hennestros, and then maybe Nylander Zahorna switching for two and three. Yeah, I would say that it's probably right now one of Zahorna, or I would say Colin White's probably at the top of that list. I mean, I somebody that Colin White too, somebody that fits the mold of that defense first, but still has some offensive upside. I know it's not the guy that's going to come in and score, you know, 15 20, um, doesn't have that capability, I don't think, in Colin White, but it's somebody that can come up and can play that role that Jansen Harkins has played, like a spark plug third line role. Uh, I feel like Vinny Henestrosa would come up if it was a fourth line spot that was open. Uh, personally, I, I know that Vinny Henestrosa has a little bit of offensive upside, but I feel like he's more like a Josh Archibald where that offensive upside is going to be on a fourth line role playing with you know Matt Nieto and Nolachari. But I mean, if for that to happen, Jeff Carter would have to vacate that right wing. And we all know that mm-hmm. Jeff Carter should not be elevated in this lineup to the third line, but I feel like it's one of Zahorna or Colin White. That's that's where I'm going to say is probably one of the first call ups. That's a, that's a fair point too. Yeah, I've you know, Vinny Henestrosa does strike you as a fourth line guy. I just figured the way he got that early push, yeah, it sticks around. It lingers. He got that early push on the first line. Maybe he can play on the third line. Um, we also just really haven't seen enough from him. So yeah, uh, there's yeah. a lot to work with. Yep, but that's going to do it for this episode of the Tip of the Iceberg. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and remember. You can find us anywhere you get your podcast from or on YouTube at Inside the Penguins. Lost my train of thought for a second, but hey, 49 minutes in happens every single time like clockwork. That's going to do it for this one. We'll see you guys next time.